In its simplest terms, biodiversity is the number of different species that call a particular area home. Biodiversity provides us with a number of services that are sometimes called ecological services. They provide us with food, they provide us with building materials, they filter our water and keep water clean, and in many cases species perform functions that we haven't yet identified, and it's important to uh, preserve these species, not only for the roles they play in supporting human lives, but also because they've evolved here for millions of years, we have the responsibility to make sure they stay here and they don't go extinct on our watch. The science of taxonomy or classifying organisms is an essential component of studying biodiversity. If we can't give names to the species that we find, it's very hard to organize them, study them, or for that matter, even compile a list of what lives here um, in the river. So the easiest way to uh, understand classification is to take a simple example. If we take something like a cat, a species that most of us are familiar with, um, they belong in the kingdom Animalia, the animal kingdom, so they're related to fish and butterflies and turtles, um, so that's a pretty broad um, level classification. We um, move down to the phylum chordata. These include mostly things that we're familiar with as vertebrates, as well as a few um, closely related animals. We break them down into um, a more precise group after that. We classify them in the class uh, mammalia. Cats are, are mammals. Uh, they have fur, and that's what separates them from all the other chordates, the turtles, the fish, the birds. Um, getting down to a more precise level, we say they're, they're, that they're in the order carnivora, so they're carnivores, so um, they're more closely related to dogs, which are also carnivores, than they are to bats and shrews, with both primarily eat insects. Then breaking them down even further, we go from the order carnivora to the family Felidae. The Felidae are the cats, so house cats are more closely related to lions than they are to wolves. And finally, we break them down even further into the genus Felis um, and um, the species Felis catus. That's the unique binomial. We call it a binomial name because there's two parts, Felis and catus. Felis catus is the house cat. Um, and it's different from all the other felidae. It's different from a lion, it's different from a leopard, and it's different from a cheetah, but they're all closely um, related. And so that's how we classify things, and that classification scheme reflects the evolutionary ancestry of, of each of the animals that we classify. So uh, when we're classifying animals, one of the first um, uh, distinctions we make is the distinction between vertebrates and invertebrates. Um, so birds, mammals, fish, reptiles, these are all groups of organisms with vertebral columns. They have vertebrae, they have backbones. And all the animals that lack that structure, lack the vertebral column, are called invertebrates. So they can range from insects to crayfish to lobsters and jellyfish, all of these lack an internal vertebral column. They wear their skeletons on the outside of their body. And in the case of some, like beetles, for example, they have hard shells on the outside of their body, which we call exoskeleton, which literally means outside skeletons. So today we're going to focus on both aquatic uh, and terrestrial uh, invertebrates. And in fact, some species spend part of their lives in the water as juveniles or as young and then become terrestrial as adults. So sometimes the distinction between aquatic and terrestrial invertebrates is not all that clear. So our methods for collecting invertebrates um, vary because the kinds of habitats that invertebrates live in vary. Um, in slower moving water, sometimes just sweeping a dip net is a better um, approach, taking a, a, um, a long handled net and just swishing it back and forth through the vegetation. Um, and if you're doing this on your own in a classroom, um, a kitchen strainer uh, and flipping over rocks works uh, perfectly fine as well. 
Uh, one of the simplest techniques is to simply put a net um, um, across a stream. Uh, this works particularly well if the water is flowing uh, quickly. Um, put a net across a stream and then disturb the uh, bottom upstream of the net and um, that will dislodge the organisms and then the flow of the water will just carry them down into the net. So now that everything that you see moving on your net, collect it and we'll put it into the buckets. Uh, continue until you have a hundred individual invertebrates, then we'll take it back to the lab and have a closer look. We call this a dichotomous key. So this um, breaks them down into different sections. So um, it's either, it's something like you would do that's a yes or no question. So you would start off with the invertebrate that you're looking under the microscope and say, does it have legs? If it has legs, then yes, you're going to go to your sheet, follow it over. How many pairs of legs? If it has more than four, if it has three, uh, you would move over and go all the way down. Once you've ID'd, you think you've ID'd something, raise your hand, Christina and I will come around and we'll see if you've uh, ID'd it correctly. So if you're going to look at this, does it have a shell or no shell? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, so a like without a shell. So is it body segmented, so into little sections? It's segmented. Yes? Oh, perfect. So you're going to follow down to here. So does it have legs or no legs? Lots of legs. It has legs, eh? So we're going to go over, see, following the uh, line here, we're going to flip it over. So we're here. Does it have four pair of legs? Um, four more than four pair of legs or three pair of legs? Three legs on each. Perfect. So we're going to go here. So from here, we're going to follow it down. Does it have wings or no wings? This one might be a little. No wings. Perfect. Does it have anything on its tail? Does it have tail yes. appendages? It does. Perfect. So we're going to keep going down. How many pail, tail appendages does it have? One, two, two, or three? Three. He's got three. Perfect. So then we're going to go to here. Does he have long, bristle-like ones, or does he have short, uh, tiny ones? It's short middle, but on the end, it's long. They're long and bristly, eh? So you're between a mayfly and a damselfly. Which one do you think that is? A damselfly. A damselfly, and you're right. That is a damselfly. So that's how you use your key. So because you identified that correctly, you're going to go take some chalk and just put a tally beside where it says damselfly nymph. One. So we're going to look at this key. All right. So does he have a shell or no shell? So it's got no shell, so you're going here. So you have this option or this option? What are these? Segmented body and unsegmented body. He's got a segment. So he definitely has a segmented body. And then from here, does he have legs? Yes. So then you're going to follow this one. He's got more than four pairs. He definitely has more than four pairs of legs. Cylinder body or flattened body? Yeah. Flattened body. So he's flattened body. Perfect. So then we're between these ones. So does he swim on a sign? No. Or does he kind of swim, like crawl? He crawls. He crawls. So what is he? He's a sow bug. He's a sow bug. Perfect. Now that you've had a look at aquatic invertebrates, we're going to switch locations and move to the Ontario Power Generations Visitor Center and shift the focus to terrestrial invertebrates. What's diff the difference between an aquatic invert and a bug? Okay, a bug it has a, a bug has gill. A bug that doesn't, doesn't live in the water. Exactly. Eh? All right. So once you catch um, some bug bugs, you can put it in the jar. All right, and we go see Brian, Wait. and he's going to help us I have identify it. Oh, hey, we caught something. What do you think it is? It's a grasshopper, and it is a mossy guess. thingy. Oh, it looks like it flew away. There he is. So I'm gonna open it, and you can put that on it. Yeah. Bring her down, or. Ta da! Ooh, that's a big one. Yeah, got it. You got it.
he will sting. You just have to wait till they calm down, and then you just slip the lid on. This one's just, he's very angry. I think he's late for a dance recital. Here. I'll put it in my hand. What is it? Oh, um, okay. I mean, grasshopper. Oh my God, I'm on fire! I just wanted that spider, man. Okay, really? Want me to release all these bugs for now and get something out? That's... Ah! You just... Oh my gosh, I got it! Yours is the only butterfly. So is your yellow that one? Mine's the only butterfly? Yeah, because the other ones are all moths. One of the reasons we <clears throat> collect and preserve specimens like this is um, to have a historical record of, of what's here. A lot of times insects are hard to identify uh, they're not very well studied, and when they disappear locally, because so few people study insects, insects often disappear before we even know they're in trouble. Most animals on the planet are insects. Yeah. Um, in fact, if you took all the animals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, and you made a list of all the species, so and you compared all the insects and listed all their species, the list would be way longer for insects. In fact, if you only took one type of insects, beetles, these are all beetles over here. Um, if you took just the beetles and put all the insects that weren't beetles in the same list of the birds and the fish and everything else, you'd have more beetles than everything else. In fact, if you took just one family of beetles, this family here that this gold beetle belongs to, the scarab beetles, and you made a list of scarab beetles, and you put all the other families of beetles in the list with all the other non-beetle insects and the mm -hmm. birds and fish, etc., you'd have more scarab beetles than all the other animals. So there are more, in, and there are more species in this family of beetles alone than all other animals put together, but very few people study insects. So if we want to understand ecosystems and how they work, we're ignoring the majority of species by focusing only on fish and birds and other things. So that's one of the reasons why studying insects is important. So what I'll do now is I'm going to show you how you preserve um, these. Every, every type of insect has a slightly different way to preserve it because when you mount them on these pins to display them like this, you want to put the pin through the part of the body that is the strongest for different types of insects. That body part is, is often different. For a moth, you put it through the thorax. So they belong to the group we call Lepidoptera. Pass me that wooden block. So this is called a pinning block. I just push that down until the pin hits the end of the hole. And then all my, all my moths are at about the same height on the pin, so they all look nice and neat. What I'm going to do in a minute is I'm going to try to spread his wings so that they look like the ones you saw over there, rather than um, the way it would naturally rest. Um, and the reason I do that is so that I can see all four wings. What I'm going to do now, I've put the pin on this side because I'm going to try to pull this wing forward. So I'm going to spread it forward and then I'm going to just drop that on it and I'm going to put my finger down there, cover it with this piece of card. And then I'm going to just pin this in place. Now I'm going to do the same on the other side. 
So this is a moth that I collected last night while I was doing an activity at the um, Ontario Power Generation Visitor Center. Um, so I would label, I'll label, uh, put a little label on one of those cards so that I remember where it's from. And then eventually I'll make a nice little neat typed label um, in really fine print like you see on some of those preserved specimens. You guys can go ahead and give it a try. He looks a lot like that. That one's a look. Yeah, yeah that one's a little bit bigger. So yeah, that's, that's what it is there. Phyllophaga longispina. Longispina. It's always better when people keep good information. All I know about him is he was collected in 2015 at, o at the OPG Visitor Center. Beetles are the order Coleoptera, so I would put O period and then Coleoptera. And after order Coleoptera, then I would put F period for the family Scarabidae because it's a scarab beetle. Okay, so and then anything else after that? Um, and then you could put the, uh, the name that you looked up, Polyphaga longispina. We know very little about most invertebrates, even though they're the most numerous types of organisms um, on the planet and probably play a disproportionately important role. So it's important to study invertebrates for that reason. It's also important to study aquatic invertebrates because they allow us to um, make inferences about water quality. So when water quality becomes degraded, we first notice changes in the invertebrate community as pollution sensitive species disappear. So that concludes our episode on the classification of organisms. I hope that next time you're in the field and you find something or catch something, you'll have a close look at its features and see if you can use those features to place the animal or organism into its proper taxonomic group.